Hi everybody, it's Jim Dolly. I'm the founder of The White Coat Investor and today we're going live for the first time ever. We're live in the Facebook group. So there's actually nobody watching this video right now. I'm hoping as this pops up in your message of physician financial literacy out there. Um, just waiting for Michelle to join the Facebook Live now. All right, the connection seems to be working okay. We'll see if we can get anybody in here. All right, we got six people in here already. This is great. Okay, so if you would like to ask questions, we're going to be answering questions today. We're going to start with just questions you leave as comments. Um, the connection should gradually improve. It was working great a few minutes ago when we tested it. Um, I see one comment there from Christian that the connection's bad. That should be getting better. Feel free to leave any questions or comments you may have uh, just as a comment on the Facebook Live, and I'm going to answer any questions you have today. Whether you want to talk about student loans, whether you want to talk about uh, investing, insurance, whatever you want to ask questions about, go ahead and start leaving comments in there, and we will see the comments. Please like and share this. That helps build the audience for the Facebook Live, not only while it's running live, but later when it is running as a uh, just a video in the Facebook group as it'll be posted afterward. Um, also, we may end up using some of this sort of content later on the podcast and YouTube. Uh, we're just trying to figure out this technology and how best we can use it to reach out to you and help you in your goal to become more financially literate. Um, one thing I'd like to do here at the beginning is bring on Michelle. Uh, if you'd leave me a comment, Michelle, I'll add you to the video here and introduce you to the group. How's that connection now? Are you guys able to hear me okay in real time? Go ahead and leave a comment letting me know how that goes. So, interesting experience I have this afternoon. I am going to the travel medicine clinic. It's like an anti-vaxxer's worst, worst nightmare, right? You got to go get a typhoid vaccine and that sort of stuff. But it is going to be interesting. I'm taking my daughter on a medical mission trip here in a couple of weeks to Honduras. One of my sponsors is going to be bringing us down there. And um, we're going to be taking care of some patients in Honduras. But we've got to make sure we don't pick up anything while we're down there. Sounds like connection's better now. Go ahead and leave any questions. This is just going to be, we're going to be on for maybe 15 or 20 minutes today. So feel free to ask any questions you like. Just leave a comment for it. And maybe even later in the broadcast, uh, if things are going well as far as the connection, uh, I may even add you to the broadcast there and um, let you ask your questions actually, you know, live. Bring your face up here. And, and ask your own questions. So any questions you may have, this is kind of an ask me anything uh, kind of event. You want to ask things about shoot the white coat investor or my practice or financial questions, which is what I kind of expect a few more of. Um, go ahead and come on, leave us a comment and we will uh, try to answer those. Um, if you're just joining us now, I am Jim Dolly. I'm the founder of The White Coat Investor. Please like and share this video so that we can build the audience for it. Uh, bear in mind, if you put comments on here, they're going to show up on the video. Um, but please do. I'm looking for questions to answer. If you guys don't give me any questions, I will simply go into the Facebook group and pull up questions out of there and start answering some of those. Uh, for example, this one from Rehan Jalal, uh, who asked this question recently in the Facebook group. He asked about his broker that's trying to convince him to buy another million dollars in insurance. Well, first of all, I don't know if you should be, you know, taking advice from a broker, right? A broker is somebody who's trying to make you broker for the most part, but they're paid by selling you stuff. Um, you know, and so their goal is always to sell you more. They always want you to have more insurance. They always want you to change investments, etc. So don't take advice from a broker. It's okay to use a broker when you need to buy something if that broker is going to, uh, you know, help you decide what you should be buying, um, you know, help you choose between various products, it's fine to use them. For example, you can go to a health insurance broker or you can go to an insurance agent. An independent insurance agent is a broker in a lot of ways. So it's okay once you decide what you need to go in and see the broker and help get the best deal on the product you want. But that's not necessarily a person you should be going to to take advice. In this particular doc's case, he was trying to get him to buy 
a, uh, a permanent life insurance policy. Permanent is just a fancy way of saying whole life insurance for the most part. And that's obviously not a product that is great to be using um, because you're paying way too much for your insurance and it's you know not a very good investment because the return is so low. It's negative for the first few years and even if you hold it for decades, it is a very low returning investment. I would expect if I held a life insurance policy for 50 years, I'd expect a return of maybe three or 4% off of it. Okay, I got my first question here on the comments. This one's coming in from Josh, uh, who's asking about real estate. He asks, I notice you have 20% of your plan in real estate, but only about 5% in REITs. And what's your logic behind that? Well, my logic is what a lot of the direct real estate investors complain about with REITs. The issue is that a REIT uh, has moderate correlation with the stock market. You know, if you may recall, uh, when the stock market crashed in 2008, uh, REITs went down even further. My investment in REITs in 2008, I lost 78% on. And so that is one downside of just buying real estate investment trusts like the Vanguard Real Estate Investment Trust Index Fund is you end up with, you know, it, it's not perfect correlation with the stock market, but it's moderately high. And so a lot of real estate investors don't like that because they want something that's going to zig when their stocks zag. So that's one downside. The other downside is they're incredibly tax inefficient. Even with the new 199A deduction that helps a little bit when it comes to REITs, in that that's eligible for that 20% deduction on the ordinary uh, business income of the REIT, um, it still is not very tax efficient. And so if you're going to invest in real estate in a taxable account, a lot of times you will find that you're better off owning the properties either directly, which comes with the downside of a lot of hassle, or using syndications, which are available to most doctors because they're accredited investors, where you go in with another 100 investors and buy an apartment complex or something like that. So my logic in not putting all of my 20% in real estate into REITs is simply to try to get lower correlation with the overall market and to try to get higher returns. And so that's, so far it's working out well for me, uh, but that's my reasoning behind it. All right, so I don't see any other questions in the comments. I'm gonna reach into the Facebook group here for another question. Uh, and see what we can talk about here. Michelle, if you are on this yet, uh, I'm not sure if you're having trouble getting on, please post a comment and I'll bring you in and introduce you. All right, in the discussion, we have a lot of good questions. I can't believe how much volume uh, of questions there are in the Facebook group now. I guess that's to be expected with over 21,000 members now. Um, all right, so here's a question. Uh, from someone about you need a budget. You need a budget is a budgeting app that a lot of people use. It's actually designed about by a company about 10 miles away from me here in Utah. Uh, I met the principals of it actually at the same dinner I met Mr. Money Mustache uh, at a conference in 2013. But it's a pretty good app. Uh, its competitors are Mint, um, and the free one out there is the one Dave Ramsey put together called Every Dollar. But a lot of people like to do their budget using these apps because you can put it in in real time. Uh, you can put all your purchases in and know where you stand and you and your spouse or your partner can use the same app to kind of be up to date all the time. My wife and I, we just always used kind of a spreadsheet, um, but we also didn't have much need for a budget after the first six months or so because we basically trained ourselves to not spend that much. And so it was okay for us not to be doing it in real time. And we've just kept doing that over the years. Okay, here's another question. This one comes in from Barry. Uh, what are your thoughts on filing for extensions for private LLC? Okay, I'm assuming we're talking about tax extensions here. Um, I had to file for tax extensions this year. It's not that big of a deal, uh, mostly because my stupid um, uh, LLCs, these K-1s I was waiting on, didn't come in in time. I'm still waiting on two K-1s. Um, one from an investment with realty shares, which I guess is to be expected given that they're going out of business. And the other one from uh, actually Passive Income MD hasn't sent me as K-1 yet. So I had to file extensions in three states and with the federal government. Not a big deal. Surprisingly easy. I wrote a blog post about it uh, just before April 15th. Um, so that's no big deal. You still got to pay the taxes. It's a little hard to estimate it sometimes if you don't have all your K-1s, but not that big of a deal. Um, I think that's what you're asking uh, in that question, Barry. 
Can you contribute to an I-401k throughout the extension period? That is a good question. I think I'd have to look that one up. I know you can contribute to an IRA and a SEP IRA throughout that extension period. But I think for an I-401k, I think you do not, you cannot wait that long to contribute. I think you have to get your contributions in there, at least the employee contributions, by something like January 15th of the next year. I think the employer contributions, you may be able to go until your tax filing deadline. Uh, you know, with the six-month extension, that would be mid-October for that. And so I think you could. Um, but bear in mind that any money you're earning in real estate isn't earned income and can't go into an, a 401k or other retirement account anyway. Only earned income can be used to go into uh, a 401k like that. Okay. Here's another question here. Oh, here's one. A lot of people like posting anonymously in the Facebook group, which I think is, is fascinating because about three quarters of the questions, I look at them and I'm like, why do you want this to be anonymous? This is just a random, normal question. I don't see what the issue is. Um, but we post them all anonymously. The, the best way to do it is just to send a direct message with the question to White Coat Investor and Michelle or I will get on there and we'll just copy and paste it uh, under our name. So no big deal. You want to ask questions anonymously, that's fine. Now, if you want to have like 10 responses back and forth anonymously, that's a little bit of a, a pain, right? If you really want to interact with the people answering your question, you probably shouldn't ask it anonymously. But, you know, maybe once or twice if you want to give some follow-up information after an anonymous post, that's okay, I think. All right, another question out of the Facebook group. Uh, what do you guys think about FDN, uh, an ETF of internet investments? I, I think this question has actually been asked twice in the last few days. I'm not sure what the interest is so much in tilting your portfolio to internet stocks. You know, this ETF has an expense ratio of about 0.5 something, as I recall when I looked it up. And so it's not particularly cheap. You know, if you bear in mind that most ETFs that are total market funds are in the three, four, five basis point range. This one's 50 basis points. But I'm just not a big factor of investing in sector funds or sector ETFs um, because, you know, you're really making a bet there. I don't know that internet stocks are going to do better than energy stocks or better than any other kind of stocks. So I don't think that's, you know, a particularly wise investment. I wouldn't necessarily include it in my portfolio. If you had some really great reason for to tilt to internet stocks for some reason, uh, then I'd limit that sort of a thing to like 5% of your portfolio. That way, if it turns out to be a terrible bet, you're not hosed. All right, I got a question here from Shelby. How long do you expect it to take to get back to broke? How long did it take you after residency? Okay, well, technically, I left medical school better than broke. Um, part of that reason was because the military paid for medical school. Um, so in that respect, my net worth was positive you know, walking out the door of medical school and going to residency. Now, it didn't grow all that much during residency. I would bet we left residency with a net worth under 20000 And so we really didn't build a lot of wealth during residency. Um, you know, we just treaded water for the most part. Yes, we uh, contributed to Roth IRAs. I think one year we didn't even max them out. And another year, I think I borrowed on a 0% credit card to max them out. It just wasn't something that was a huge priority for us to save in residency. And that's really the case for everybody. The truth is you're not going to become rich as a resident. The goal is to hit the ground running as an attending. The wealth building tool you have as a doctor is your attending income. It's all about getting that uh, attending income going and doing things right as you come out of residency. So don't impoverish yourself as a residency trying to get rich as a resident. Does it really matter if your net worth is $40,000 when you leave residency or $50,000? Not really. I mean, that's an amount of money that many doctors are saving every month uh, once they become an attending. So um, keep that in mind as, as you're a resident. So how long should it take to get back to broke? Well, it really depends on how, um, you know, how much debt you have. If you're a pediatrician, you owe $600,000, you might not get back to broke until you get public service loan forgiveness seven years out of residency. Um, but I think for a typical doc, if you come out of residency making $200,000 uh, and you, uh, you know, you come out of residency owing $200,000 in student loans, you're making, let's say you're making the average physician wage this year, that's $275,000. How long should it take you to get back to a net worth of zero? Well, I'd like to think you could do that in less than two years. 
And the reason why is I'd hope you continue to live like a resident, you know, off fifty or sixty thousand dollars a year. So even after you pay your taxes on that two hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars, you should have a hundred thousand dollars plus going toward building wealth. Whether that is uh, paying down debt, or whether that's going into retirement accounts, or whether that's going toward saving up a down payment for a house, or toward building your emergency fund, it's all building wealth. And if you're putting a hundred thousand dollars a year toward building wealth, and you started out two hundred in the hole. You ought to be back to broke within a couple of years, right? So, all right, let's take the next question. This one's from Josh again. Uh, me and Josh, we're just going to have a private conversation here. Maybe I ought to bring him on uh, video and we'll, uh, and we'll let you see what Josh looks like. Anyway, um, the rule of thumb for retirement is a 4% rule. Okay, that's, that's a reasonable place to start. Uh, if you want to punch out around 55 or 59, how do you account for Social Security? Okay, that's a great question. Here's the way I look at it. If you're retiring really early, like 50 or 45, you pretty much need to ignore Social Security. And the reason why is it's so long until it's going to start paying out from that point, especially if you delay till 70 like you probably should, that you should not um, necessarily um, count on it at all. Because you need enough money to get you 20 years or 25 years, that's basically the same amount of money you're going to need to go indefinitely. And so the further away you are from Social Security, the less you should count it into your plan. But if you're retiring at 59, I mean, you can start getting Social Security as early as 62. Um, you know, although most people, if they're married, you know, maybe the lower earner takes it at full retirement age at 67 or so, and the higher earner takes it at 70. Uh, and so you can kind of bake that into your plan. Just bear in mind, uh, the way to look at it is maybe you withdraw a little bit more from your portfolio until Social Security hits, and then plan to withdraw a little bit less from your portfolio after you start getting Social Security. So you just kind of have to bake it in there. In reality, delaying Social Security is the best uh, immediate annuity you can buy. Uh, in, because the problem with buying an immediate annuity is that um, the insurance company wants to make a profit, number one, and number two, healthy people are more likely to buy the annuity whereas everybody gets Social Security. And so it's actually a better deal to delay Social Security than to buy an immediate annuity. So keep that in mind if you're looking at that in your 60s. Okay, a couple more questions coming in here. This is great. Uh, this one's from Randall. Are, are the fee-only advisors on WCI vetted well? Well, here's how they're vetted. I'll just tell you how they're vetted, and you can decide if that's well or not. I probably turn down about two-thirds of the advisors that apply there. And that's after they fill out an application, which makes it pretty obvious what I'm looking for. I don't think that questions I ask on the application are really all that difficult, especially if you pay any attention whatsoever to what I say on the podcast or what I write in on the blog, right? Occasionally, I get somebody that, that comes in and talks about, you know, how their clients all have whole life insurance and loaded mutual funds. And I'm like, you have no idea what I'm teaching people. Um, but... So about one third of them I actually approve. Only a percentage of those then decide to advertise with me. So all the people on the recommended page are advertisers. They are paying to be there. So what is the vetting? Well, the vetting, I basically look at three things. I look at their website and make sure they're not saying crazy stuff on there. I like to see if they'll put their fees on the website. Most of the time, if you won't put your fees on the website, it's because they're too high. Two, I look at their ADV2. This is their required uh, disclosure that they have to file with the SEC. And you can look it up for any advisor and, and see what they're actually saying there. And I think that's pretty helpful to be able to get on there and ask, um, you know, look at the things they've had to disclose. Like if they've had to been sued or something, if they've had a complaint filed against them, that stuff all has to be disclosed there. Also, they have to disclose their pricing structure. They have to disclose their investment techniques. And so I think that's useful to look at as well. And then I've got an application. If you go to that page, you'll see for almost all the advisors, I've just included the application there in their uh, link. And so if you click on that, you can read what their actual answers to my questions were. And of course, no advisor is perfect. I've yet to find an advisor that I liked perfectly every single answer they give. But you can see the things I'm asking them. And, and that's kind of a good sign that those are things that I think are important and that you should be asking your advisors when you go to vet them. So that's what I do before I sell them the listing in the first place. If they pass all that for me, I sell them a listing. 
Now we also have an ongoing vetting and that comes from you. So if you use an advisor, you have particularly good experience, you shoot me an email about it, you say this person's awesome, that's great. That helps me know, okay, I'm doing a good job. Occasionally I get some negative feedback about an advisor and I get enough of that, I take them off the list. So there's some continuous vetting going on by the regular white coat investors, readers, listeners, etc. Um, so is the vetting perfect? No, but I think it's a great place to start. Certainly more vetting than most of you looking for an advisor have done uh, on your own. All right, next question comes from uh, Annie, who's asking about how do you determine how much to spend on vehicles for you and spouse? Well, at this point, we're financially independent. We have very high income. We buy what we want. So we want to drive something, we go to the dealership and we buy it. Um, so that's what we do personally. But that's not what we did for a long time, especially when we were building wealth. Um, I'm not really a car guy, so my approach was, well, what is basic transportation cost? I remember when I came out of residency, I went on to, um, you know, we went to the military, or we had a net worth of, I don't know, $20,000. We were buying a little town home. Uh, didn't have that much money, but we decided we needed a second car. My wife wanted to drive the car we had uh, with our young daughter, and she was, oh, she must have been, shoot, four months pregnant at that point. And so we decided to get a car for me to commute in. And so I went down to the auction and bought a Mazda 626. And that car cost, I think it was 1750 bucks or something like that. And I probably should have checked the AC a little better because there in Southern Virginia, it was a little warm when I realized the AC didn't work. Um, and so for the next four years, I had 440 AC, you know, I'd uh, roll down all four windows and drive 40 miles an hour, but it was basic transportation. That car literally had almost no problems. It didn't start one morning. So I got a jump and went and bought a new battery for it. I had to buy new windshield wipers and I put some used tires on it and that's it in four years. And then I sold it for 1500. I would have sold it for 1750, but my wife wouldn't let me because it was one of her friends I was selling it to. But basic transportation is very cheap. $5,000 gives you basic transportation. So if you've got financial goals you're trying to reach, your savings rate isn't as high as you'd like it to be, you don't have much money, I encourage you to go look for a five dollars or $10,000 car. Um, certainly, if you're having to finance the car, keep it inexpensive, right? If, you, if you're just in a situation where you have to finance the car, don't go buy a $30,000 car. Go buy a five dollars or $10,000 car pay it off quickly, and then keep making those payments to yourself. Um, and so that the next car you have, you can move up in car and drive something nicer, right? I'm not saying drive a beater the rest of your life, but you can then pay cash for it. Whether it's a nicer car that's used or whether it's a brand new Tesla, if you have the cash and you're meeting your financial goals, go for it. All right, next question comes from James, who's asking, have you ever considered an all-weather or golden butterfly portfolio? I don't know the golden butterfly portfolio. I'll Google it here in a second. An all weather portfolio tends to be something like 25% stocks and 25% bonds and 25% gold and 25% cash, that sort of a thing. The idea behind those is that you're, the portfolio will do okay in any type of future economic scenario. And um, I think the problem with most of those portfolios is they just put too much emphasis on uh, poor economic periods. For example, 25% of a portfolio in gold. Most of the time, the economy does great. And the problem with gold is in the long run, it only keeps up with inflation. 800 years ago, an ounce of gold bought a nice man's suit. And today, an ounce of gold buys a nice man's suit. And so it's not very high returns. And most of us need higher returns than that to meet our goals. The reason why is we're not willing to save as much of our portfolio as we would have to in order to um, reach uh, you know, our reasonable financial goals. If you're only investing in safe investments like CDs and whole life insurance and bonds, you have to save like 50% of your gross income for an entire career in order to maintain your standard of living in retirement. So most of us need to take more risk than that. And that means more stocks, more real estate, those kinds of things. And so I think, particularly in the first half of your career, your portfolio ought to have more assets like real estate and stocks in it than gold and bonds and that sort of stuff. So I think that's the main issue I have with those kinds of portfolios is they just don't take enough risk. 
uh, it's a little bit like um, what I call the triumph of the optimists, right? It turns out that optimism has been the right move throughout the history of man because we generally progress and we get better and things do well. Um, the problem is pessimism is so seductive, it's so sexy, it sounds so smart to be pessimistic. And so you listen to these perma bearers uh, that give all these great reasons why the market is not going to do well. And then 10 years later, you look at it and you're like, well, it did okay. Um, and so I encourage you to be a little more optimistic. And while it's fine to have some of those asset classes in your portfolio, I would not you know, put a huge chunk of your portfolio into those types of assets. Let me look up the Golden Butterfly portfolio and see what that is specifically. Um, that one I haven't heard of, but let's see what it is. You know, you can name a portfolio anything you like. Okay, the all-weather portfolio and the Golden Butterfly portfolio. Uh, looks like this is something Ray Dalio is pushing, who's a big gold bug, uh, as it turns out. Um, let's see if he actually says what it is. So Ray Dalio's all-weather portfolio and the Golden Butterfly portfolio. Okay, so Golden Butterfly is 20% large cap blend, 20% small cap value, 20% long-term treasuries, 20% short-term treasuries, and 20% gold. It's not crazy, it's only 40% stock. I don't think that's enough if you're in the first half of your career, uh, unless you have really low risk tolerance. So I would, don't, wouldn't necessarily advocate for that. Maybe it's okay for a retiree, um, but that's an awful lot of money in, in golden bonds. So I wouldn't expect awesome performance out of that long term. Okay. Certainly it would reduce volatility though, James, to, uh, um, you know, reduce that. Bear in mind, gold's pretty volatile stuff though, despite it's not great long-term returns. If you look at the month-to-month -month volatility, it's actually pretty impressive. Okay, next question comes from Kyle. Hey Kyle, I've seen a lot of your comments around. It's good to see you on here today. Is it reasonable to put money into an investment account and withdraw it to pay down the student loans in the event that public service loan forgiveness doesn't pan out? Yes, that's what I call a public service loan forgiveness side fund. I encourage you, if you're going for public service loan forgiveness, to have that sort of a side fund. Um, what I would not do necessarily is to spend more on lifestyle because you're going for public service loan forgiveness. I think what a lot of people do is they go, well, I don't have to pay on my loans, so I'm gonna spend that money and instead of investing it. And the problem is if public service loan forgiveness doesn't work out because of the legislative risk, you know, Congress changes the rules on you, or because the people running it are incompetent, which seems to be the big problem with public service loan forgiveness right now, or just because you change jobs, you decide to go part-time so your payments don't count anymore, or you go work for a, a private practice employer uh, rather than a 501c3, um, now you're kind of up a creek if you don't have a side fund. And so I encourage you to still live like a resident, live like you're gonna pay off those loans in two to five years, but instead of making payments to the uh, lender, make them to your own investment account. Hope that's helpful. Okay, this one's from Daniel who's asking, uh, about medical school uh, loans. What should you do when you come out with your loans? Should you consolidate them um, in order to maximize your repay? Um, I think what he's asking here is about how quickly you can get into repay. And if you look at the blog, you'll see a post on enrolling in repay early. And this is from a medical student who graduated and basically was making repay payments by like June or July, rather than waiting for the six month waiting period. And the benefit of doing that is not only are you getting some you know, extra subsidy from that repay interest subsidy, but you have more money to be forgiven through public service loan forgiveness at the end of the period. Um, and so I think that's great uh, to enroll as soon as you can, particularly if you're going for public service loan forgiveness. Um, he says, there's caveats. My wife and I earned about 24,000 my fourth year of medical school. Um, so yeah, you, there's a good chance you're gonna be paying more than zero dollars over the next year, but you just have to run the numbers and see what your payments are gonna be. Either way, even if you made $24,000 your last year of med school, uh, you're still gonna be making payments that are way smaller than what they would be under the 10-year standard repayment program that you typically pay at as an attending. So the idea behind public service loan forgiveness is to make all these tiny payments during residency and fellowship. Because all those payments, whether they're $0 or $100 or $400 a month, they all count the same toward those 120 payments you need to get public service loan forgiveness. They count just as much as a $5,000 payment you might make later as an attending. And so I think it's great to, to start making those as soon as you can. 
Um, should I be stating my wife had a change of income to zero dollars when consolidating since I'm displacing her? Um, I don't know. I'd have to look at the application, see how they're asking the questions. If they're asking what was your income over the last year, I think you got to tell them that. If they're asking what you expect it to be over the next year, then I think you've got to tell them that. But I haven't looked at that form lately. I'm not sure what it says. Um, but bear in mind, there's not like an audit agency for the student loan organization. I mean, these guys can't even count to 120. They're totally incompetent. So a lot of people are like, well, well am I going to get audited by the IRS? The IRS isn't running the student loan program. And so I, I think there's a little bit more leeway there for stating what your income is. When I talk to these student loan specialists that are giving advice to people on student loans, they're pretty cavalier. Uh, as far as stating what your income year is and how often you got to go back to them and tell them you had an income change. Um, they're pretty aggressive on that stuff. Uh, take from that what you will. I encourage you to still be honest and ethical uh, as far as what your income is, um, but bear in mind that there's a fair amount of gray area as far as uh, when you report your income changes. All right, let's talk about this uh, uh, question from Turpentine Smith. Uh, what are your thoughts on renting? for an extended period of time versus owning a home in an area that you know you'll be staying in while working on building wealth? Well, I'm a big fan of ownership. I think ownership's a good thing. I like it when you own your practice. I like it when you own investments like stocks and real estate. Uh, I like owning your car as opposed to leasing it, which is basically renting it long term. Uh, and I like owning homes because when you get great appreciation, um, you get to benefit from that. Also, eventually, the home's paid off and the cost of your housing goes down dramatically when you're just paying for insurance and maintenance and property taxes. So renting for an extended period of time, I'm not a fan of. If you're going to be in a stable personal and a stable uh, job situation for 10 or 15 years, I think you ought to look into owning a home. Now, I fully understand that there are areas of this country where that is really hard to do. You know, if you're in San Francisco, I was uh, looking at some figures for a blog post yesterday. This two bedroom, one bath house in San Francisco was like $2.3 million. It was crazy. It was renting for just $5,900, which while that sounds like a lot of money, um, you know, is, is really about a quarter of what you'd expect that rent to be if you were in the Midwest. Um, you know, with those sorts of ratios. And so I can understand why people might go, well, maybe renting's a great idea. But you got to realize that in those areas, oftentimes the rate of appreciation is higher too than it might be in the Midwest. Now, you can't guarantee appreciation, but it's certainly more likely that a home in downtown San Francisco is going to appreciate a little bit faster than a home in downtown Indianapolis. And so if you're going to be someplace for longer than five years, you're going to be in that home longer than five years, you're usually better off buying it. You know, I tell residents don't, you know, rent, don't buy. And I tell people right when they come out of residency for six or 12 months or so until you know the job likes you and you like the job to rent and not buy. But eventually, I think you're usually better off buying. The nice thing about renting is you don't have to worry about all that maintenance crap. And you can also... Um, you know, move relatively easily. I mean, your contract's usually at most a year. And so you're just a lot more mobile. You have a lot more options. Uh, there are a lot of benefits to renting, but I think long-term, you're usually better off financially owning. Okay, this one comes from Themis Themis. I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce that. I apologize. What's your advice for docs starting their career with zero dollars in loans? Well, congratulations. Um, that's wonderful. I know there's a lot of people listening to this that are like, oh, this stinks. Uh, you know, someone's got zero, I got 200 or 300 or 400 or $500,000 in loans. And so just realize you're very, very fortunate if that's the case. Uh, but there are plenty like you. It turns out if you survey graduating fourth year medical students, about a quarter of them, 27% last year, had zero dollars in student loans. Now, whether that's because they've committed some time to the military or uh, to the Indian Health Service, or whether they uh, just went to a really cheap med school or had a great scholarship, or their parents helped them out, which is probably the usual case, um, you know, you're just in a fortunate position. So you can start building wealth right away. Um, so I would recommend during your uh, residency and fellowship that you invest a little more than maybe somebody with a bunch of loans would, right? Those people might be making two or $300 a month in student loan payments. So you ought to be investing that money. Um, and, uh, but I still recommend that you have a live like a resident period of a certain period of time, uh, probably a minimum of two years. 
and just use that to save up a down payment on your dream home to really catch up to your college peers on retirement savings, etc. You know, I don't think you can just be totally cavalier about it, but obviously you have a ton more breathing room than the average medical student who graduates medical school with $200,000 in debt, two fifty dollars for DOs, two eighty dollars or so for dentists, uh, and that usually grows during residency. And so you start out ahead, you know, you just got to be careful. All right. K.E. Tong uh, wants to argue with me. That's not unusual. We've had a lot of good arguments over the years. Uh, you can invest in San Francisco through potentially undervalued real estate developers. Uh, okay. Um, I'm not sure what your point is. We were talking about buying and investing, uh, buying versus renting what you're living in. Um, I'm fine with investing wherever you want to invest in. That's okay. Um, but we were talking about what you're living in, I think. Peter, good to see you. Glad you like the facial hair. I actually had to stop shaving. It was a terrible story. I showed up at a shift one morning. I don't know if I was half asleep when I shaved and I missed half my mustache. So my partner was making fun of me. So I went in and got those terrible, terrible razors that we use to shave people's chests before you put an EKG on them and tried to shave half my mustache. Uh, it took about 45 minutes to stop the bleeding. It was a pretty terrible idea. And I haven't shaved since, so I've been trying to, uh, you know, let that heal a little bit. But we'll see how long the facial hair stays this summer. All right. Okay, let's look at the Facebook group, see what other questions we have here um, out of the group. Michelle, are you on here? If you are, please leave me a comment. I'm not sure why I can't see you. The plan was to bring Michelle on here and introduce her to you guys, have her say hi, but uh, I haven't seen her yet. All right, so let's talk about some of these other things. Okay, here's a question here. Uh, this was one of our anonymous questions. This is an orthodontist on a W-2 uh, who is asking about um, a lot of different questions. Um, this is a doc, uh, it looks like, with some questions about um, disability insurance. Um, as well as organizing priorities more than anything. You know, basically, this is the question we all have coming out of residency, right? We got limited money and we're trying to decide how, what to put it to. You know, how much goes to the emergency fund? How much goes toward, you know, insurance? How much is going toward our savings? How much is going toward investments? How much is paying down our student loans, et cetera? And so this is kind of a classic question. Um, so what were his questions? Well, where do you go to set up 529s? Well, let's hit that one. That's an easy question. First, you look at your own state. If your state gives you a tax benefit for 529s, then go to your state, at least to the maximum tax benefit. In Utah, I get a 5% credit on up to $4,000 per kid. So my first $4,000 obviously would go into the Utah 529 plan. After that, if you're gonna invest more than that in any given year, then you want to look at, well, what's the best plan? Now, it's easy to keep it simple and just keep it at your own state plan, especially if you're using it for the first few thousand dollars. Um, but, you know, some people actually look for the best plan for every dollar after that. So where are the best plans? Well, the best plans are Utah, Nevada, New York, California. Uh, Ohio often shows up on those lists. You know, there's a, li there's a group of about six or eight plans that are always... You know, bouncing in and out of the top five anytime anybody does a, a rating system. But Utah, Nevada, usually New York, usually California are always on that list. Um, so that's, that's good. Uh, go to those places to start your 529s. If you don't get a state tax break, um, like, uh, you know, about half the states don't, um, just go directly to those state 529s and use those. If you're not saving very much and you don't get a state tax break, you can use a Coverdell ESA. That has a contribution limit of $2,000 per year, but you can open that up just going to a, you know, a typical Fidelity or Vanguard type place. I'd have to double check. I can't remember. Vanguard might have gotten out of that business a few years ago, um, but you can still open it at plenty of brokerages if you just want to keep it simple and not deal with the state 529. There are a couple of states that give you a tax credit no matter who's, which state's 529 you use, which is I think is interesting. Um, All right, the other question this doc asked was, does a $3 million life policy seem like too much? Not really. You know, I think most docs coming out of residency, you usually have a fair amount of debt. You don't have any assets. Um, you know, you got a, a partner that 
expects to live a reasonable life if you keel over next week. Uh, I think a typical amount of term life insurance to be starting your career out as a doc these days is somewhere between two and five million. So I don't think three million is crazy at all. I'd totally go for that um, if I were coming out today. I think the most we ever had was about 2.2 million. Um, we've got less now and probably be canceling it soon in the next year or two. Okay, Jason's asking, why not invest college savings first in a Coverdell account? Well, if you can get a state tax break, then you should get that first. If you don't get a state tax break, it's perfectly fine to put your first $2,000 into a Coverdell uh, educational savings account. Nothing wrong with that. Um, but don't leave a tax break on the table if you can get one. The other thing you can often get in an ESA is you can get cheaper fees than a 529. I mean, the best 529s don't have very high fees, but they do have a little bit of extra fees there. So um, that would be one benefit uh, of an ESA over that. Can I open up more than one 529 plan for my child? Uh, yeah, you can. Nobody's watching this very closely. Um, and so it's really dictated by state law. Bear in mind, you're not going to get an additional state tax break, um, but you would be able to have that money grow tax-free if used for college. But it's kind of pointless if you really think about it. I mean, think about how much money can go in a 529. If you're married, you can put 15000 in there per kid, right? And your spouse can put 15000 in there per kid. That's $30,000 a year. And you can front load the first five years if you want to. So that's $150,000 you can put in there when your kid is born. When they turn five, you can put in another $150,000. When you, they turn 10, you can put in another $150,000. I mean, how much do you want in the 529? So I think it's pretty rare that people are maxing out multiple state 529s, but I haven't seen a law that says you can't do that if you really want to. So uh, keep that in mind. I don't see any real point to it, but I think you could if you wanted to. Okay. Kenneth is asking about maxing out your retirement. What does that really mean? Um, well, let's talk about that. Uh, everybody is going to be different because it depends on what you have available to you and what the maximum contribution limits are to you. For example, once you turn 50, your uh, 401k and your 403b has an extra $6,000 catch-up contribution that you can contribute to it. Same with uh, a Roth IRA. Instead of putting $6,000 in there per year, you can put in $7,000 per year. And same amount for your spouse if you're doing a spouse or Roth IRA. And uh, for a HSA, you get a $1,000 contribution once you turn 55. And so different people have different maximum contributions to the same plans. As far as a typical 401k, the limits are $19,000 for your employee contribution. That can either be a Roth contribution or it can be a tax deferred contribution. That is one $19,000 employee contribution, no matter how many 401ks you have or how many employers you have. But each 401k at an independent employer has a maximum contribution this year of $56,000. But since you can only put 19,000 in as an employee total, all of the extra contributions that get you to $56,000 possibly in more than one 401k, have to be either employer contributions or after tax, you know, mega backdoor Roth IRA contributions if your plan allows it. Uh, so I hope that makes sense. So what do I have? What's my maximum is maybe the best way to explain this. Well, I've got a 401k profit sharing plan down at my partnership. So I can put in a $19,000 employee contribution plus 20% of everything I earn down there into the plan. Now, I don't make all that much down there because I'm down to half time now, uh, but I expect to be able to put in maybe $35,000, $40,000 this year into that 401k. They also have a cash balance defined benefit plan down there. Given my age and the way the plan is designed, I can put in $17,500 into that plan. Now, I have a totally separate 401k. It's an individual 401k for the white coat investor where my wife and I can each put in another $56,000 there. We also each have a backdoor Roth IRA that we put another $6,000 into. That limit is completely separate from your 401k limit. And then we have an HSA that we put $7,000 into. So maxing out our retirement is all of that. And that's, I don't know, somewhere between $150,000 and $200,000 a year. I mean, it's a lot of income. It was difficult to max out that much before the white coat investors started making a lot of money. Um, and so, you know, you may not be able to max out your retirement. 
But what a lot of people end up with is they end up just with a 401k that they can put in 19,000 to and their employer gives them maybe five grand and they can do a backdoor Roth IRA for each of them and maybe they got an HSA and maybe that totals only, you know, $35,000, $40,000 and they want to be saving $60,000 toward retirement. So they have to, in order to get to their $60,000 mark, which might be 20% of their gross income, they have to save in a, in a taxable account. For many years, we didn't have to do that just because we had plenty of retirement space available to us. It was difficult for us just to come up with enough savings to max out our retirement accounts. Hope that's helpful. Okay, another question. Uh, this one comes from Oscar. Um, Fresh out of fellowship on a visa. Oh, these questions are always tough. Visa questions are tough because they start asking me about tax laws in other countries. In order to qualify for mortgage, I had to split my mortgage. Um, okay, so that's an interesting mortgage setup there. Um, I don't have any other debt above 5% and have a net worth of about 170000 That's great. Would you recommend working on paying off the balloon mortgage fast, increasing your emergency fund, or funding a Roth IRA through the back door? Well, I'm a big fan of retirement accounts, so if you haven't maxed out a Roth IRA, I'd probably do that first. Um, this balloon loan, you got seven years still, and it's only 122000 So I think most docs shouldn't have too much trouble paying that off in seven years while still maxing out their retirement accounts. Um, I don't see what the interest rate is on that. Oh, it's 5%, so it's a little bit higher than the regular mortgage. Um, sure, I mean, I'd, that'd be a priority for me to pay off that balloon loan, that second mortgage you've got. Um, I don't think I would skip funding a Roth IRA for it. I probably wouldn't skip an emergency fund. I'd probably might have a smaller emergency fund, maybe one to three months worth of your expenses. Um, but I would still try to, uh, you know, get rid of that in less than seven years. Um, you know, you don't want to stretch that out anymore than you have to. 5% as a guaranteed return, that's fairly, that's fairly attractive to me. You know, if I had a 5% guaranteed investment right now, I'd be putting a lot of money into it. I don't have one though. Okay, this one from Alex. Share your page with lots of vets. Thank you. I appreciate that. I do have a fair number of veterinarian readers. We've had a few veterinarian guest posts recently. And so I appreciate uh, you guys sharing with each other and, and enjoying yourselves on the site. Uh, veterinarians have a tough road. You know, I think it's a little bit easier to get a job as a vet than an attorney, but they also usually come out with higher debt. Um, I've been pretty impressed with some of the debt loads of veterinarians I've run into. A lot of them owe close to what the average physician owns, uh, and yet oftentimes only make seventy or eighty thousand dollars a year. So it can be a tough road. Um, you really have to be dedicated to the profession, I think, to go into a veterinary school anymore. It wouldn't surprise me in a few years if really only the rich could afford to become vets, um, because it's it's just the debt to income ratio is just so outrageous there. Okay, another one from KE, question on cybersecurity recommendations for accounts. Um, what are my thoughts on it? Well, I mean, the, most of these uh, investing accounts you have uh, offer varying levels of security. So if you're particularly concerned about that, go for the highest level. You know, I've noticed when I call up Vanguard, they want to use my voice to identify me. Um, you know, every time I want to log in, they send a text to my phone. I've got to put that number in in order to log in. I think they call that uh, two-factor authentication. You should probably be using that. You should be using strong passwords. Some people buy a dedicated computer just to log on to their financial accounts. I think that's probably overkill, but I'd certainly be careful logging in at work or at the library, that sort of a thing. That's an easy place to get burned. Um, you know, so I think being smart about your cybersecurity is, is an awfully good idea. Keep in mind that a lot of these investment accounts do not have any sort of protection against fraud at the same time. There is a post on the website. It is called um, Rules for Multiple 401ks or something like that. Um, and basically the way it works out is the employers have to be independent. It can't be, you know, two businesses that you started that you own them both, right? You can't have two 401ks for that. But what it, how it typically works out for a doc is they have a 401k offered by their employer and then they do some moonlighting on the other side and get an individual 401k. That's the usual setup for a doc. And yes, you can max both of those out at the same time, $56,000 a year. Okay, uh, Claire is asking about backdoor Roth IRAs. I can't do it um, because I have a Vanguard IRA for my old 401k. What other avenues do I have? Well, first of all, you may still be able to do it. If you have a current 401k, you can just roll that IRA into your current 401k. If you have some self-employment income, you can open an individual 401k and roll that IRA in there. 
and then all of a sudden you're allowed to do a backdoor Roth IRA. You can also, if it's a small 401k, just pay to convert the whole thing. You know, if you got a six or $7,000 IRA from a previous employer, just pay taxes on that six or $7,000 and put it in the Roth IRA and start doing backdoor Roth IRAs. That doesn't work so well if you got a $500,000 IRA, uh, but for a really small one, it would be no big deal. But if you truly have no other avenues, you've maxed out all of your uh, retirement accounts and it doesn't look like a backdoor Roth is really a great option for you for whatever reason, then you just invest in a taxable account. It's okay. You get a lower uh, you know, rate on capital gains, uh, long-term capital gains taxes. You get qualified dividends come in at a lower rate. You can do tax loss harvesting. You can donate it appreciated shares to charity. It's not the end of the world to invest in a taxable account. If you're buying real estate, you can shelter some of that income with depreciation. Uh, you know, there's lots of tax breaks available in a taxable account. You shouldn't be afraid of it. And certainly don't be so afraid of it that you end up buying some crappy insurance product that somebody's pushing at you, whole life insurance or some annuity uh, to avoid that. Okay, let's go to Amit's question. I have uh, two car loans, uh, one at 3% and a 30-year mortgage, at, or they're both at 3% and a 30-year mortgage at 4.75%. Do you think it's worth paying these debts down or off? Uh, my wife and I are debating buying a hotel in the next year or two if we can find a deal. We'll have to finance the debt on that purchase at a higher rate. A lot of debt there. Um, I assume there might be some student loans in there as well. I'm not a big fan of car loans. I think it's kind of silly for docs to have car loans because, as I mentioned earlier, basic transportation is basically five grand. You know, if I buy a five thousand dollar car. I expect to drive it three or four years and, and, you know, and have the car last. So that's basic transportation. Um, it seems really silly to be making 15 or 20 or 25 or $30,000 a month and have to finance a car to me. Uh, I feel like I can just save that out of one month's paycheck and go buy a car. Um, you know, if you want to buy a nicer one, you got to save up longer, obviously. But with basic transportation so cheap, I think car loans are kind of silly. Um, so I don't, I don't buy cars on credit. Um, now, if we're just talking about the sheer finances of it all, chances are a 3% car loan, a 4.75% mortgage, assuming you're itemizing, they're pretty equivalent debts. Uh, you know, they're both around 3% after tax. Do I think it's worth paying those debts off? Well, I don't know what your other options are, right? If you got a screaming deal on a hotel you want to buy, uh, well, maybe that's a better use for your money. If you're not maxing out your retirement accounts, maybe that's a better use for your money. If you got student loans at 8%, that's surely a better use for your money. And so I'd have to look at the whole picture to know whether it's paying those debts down or off. But keep this in mind, at a certain point, even getting a 3% guaranteed return is attractive to a lot of people. Uh, in my case, I'd, I'd take that. If I had a 3% debt, I'd pay it off um, rather than trying to you know, uh, take on more risk and, and invest that money in stocks or real estate. But I don't have a lot of need to leverage up my life at this point. I'm already financially independent. Um, I don't really have a need to do that. If you did and you felt like that risk was worth taking, it's not crazy to borrow at 3% and try to earn a little bit higher return. Certainly, if you're about to take out an 8% loan on a hotel, um, you know, uh, or 6% real estate loan, um, you know, you're better off paying that down than 3% loan on your cars. But frankly, I'd sell the car and buy a $5,000 one and just eliminate that debt from my life. Okay, thoughts about future tax liability with all the tax deferred income you are able to stash away. I'm not all that worried about it. I did a post not that long ago about uh, don't fear the reaper and it was talking about RMDs, required minimum distributions. So starting at age 70, you gotta start taking money out of your tax deferred accounts, your IRAs and your 401ks. But if you think about it, if that's your only taxable income, you have to have huge IRAs in order to get into the same bracket you're in now. Um, bear in mind, when you pull money out, you fill up the brackets, right? I'm married, and so we got a $24,400 uh, standard deduction. So the first $24,400 in taxable income we have every year is tax-free. So if I get a 37% deduction or 42% counting state for putting money in and I can pull some of it out at 0%, that's a great deal. Another 19,000 comes out at 10%, another 50,000 comes out at 12%, another 75,000 comes out at 24%. Um, you know, so I think for most docs, tax deferred during your peak earnings years is still the way to go. 
Now, do I worry that given how much we're saving, this could become an issue for us because we're kind of super savers? Yeah. Um, but this year, if you saw my recent post on the Mega Backdoor Roth IRA, we're doing a lot more Roth contributions than we have in the past. So the solution to a future RMD problem, if you're actually going to have one, is not to avoid retirement accounts, it's to do Roth conversions. Um, so if that's your big concern, I would um, you know, do more Roth conversions, do more Roth contributions, etc. But if you're not going to have a $5 million plus IRA, I don't think I'd spend a lot of time worrying about that. And that's in today's dollars, right? The tax brackets are going to go up with time. Okay, I think I answered your question, Amit. Well, Michelle, if you're on here, give me, a, give me a comment here so I can bring you on and introduce you. Otherwise, I think we're going to skip doing that and uh, wrap this up here in a minute. If someone wants to give any other questions, uh, that would be... Uh, we'll take a couple more here. In fact, maybe what we'll try to do, just because this is our big trial... Um, we're going to uh, have you come on and actually bring you on live and have you ask your questions. So uh, let's see, if you are willing to come on here, we're gonna pop your picture up in a little box in box and we'll just have a conversation here between the two of us about your question. If you're willing to do that, just post that in the comment with your question and, uh, and I'll hit you, I'll click on your name and, and we'll bring you up live here. Okay, this one's from Randall. Can you synopsize where you would allocate bonds, mutual funds, and U.S. total market, S&P index, REITs, and emerging markets? Um, so you're asking for an asset allocation. You know, what percentage of your portfolio should go into stocks and bonds and real estate, et cetera? There's no right answer there. The key is to pick something reasonable that you can live with long term and stick with it. You know, there are all kinds of different ways to invest that are reasonable. Um, you know, so what I often do when I'm doing presentations is I put up reasonable portfolios and show why they're reasonable, and I put up unreasonable portfolios. For example, an unreasonable portfolio is 25% in gold, 25% in Apple stock, 25% in an individual municipal bond, and 25% in your brother-in-law's small business, right? It's just totally unreasonable. It's not diversified. It's, uh, you know, taking on too much of the wrong kinds of risk and not enough of the right kinds of risk. It, it's crazy. Um, but when you're talking about reasonable investments, low-cost index funds, uh, broadly-based index funds, etc., cetera, um, you know, any reasonable mix is okay. So what do I define as reasonable? Well, um, I guess I would say um, reasonable would be a stock to bond ratio between 25% and 75%. So somewhere between 25% stocks and 75% stocks is reasonable. How much in emerging markets? I'd say less than 20%. Uh, how much in REITs? I would say less than 20%. And I wouldn't use both a total market index and an S&P 500 index. They're basically the same thing. The correlation between them is 0.99. Um, so I wouldn't use both of those. Okay, looks like you're actually meant to ask about asset location, which is a totally different question. Um, you know, and this is which assets do you put into a 401k, which ones do you put into a Roth, which do you put into taxable? Uh, and there's a few general rules here. There's no absolute guidelines. But if you have a low returning asset class that is very tax efficient, that clearly should go into a taxable account. If you have a very high returning asset class, that is very tax inefficient, that should clearly go into a tax protected account. And so uh, in between those things, there's a lot of gray areas. Um, you know, for example, a total stock market index fund is very tax efficient, but also you expect a fairly high return out of it. And so that can go both in a tax protected and a taxable account. As far as the Roth versus tax deferred decision, a lot of people just don't understand what a tax-deferred account is. A tax-deferred account is best thought of as a, partly a Roth or tax-free account and partly a government account that you're investing on behalf of the government. So in reality, if you had a $100,000 um, traditional IRA, it's really 70% yours and 30% the government's. So that 70% that's yours, that 70000 is exactly the same as a $70,000 Roth IRA. And so what a lot of people say is, well, put your uh, asset classes that you expect a really high return in the total international stock market index fund. Okay. Let's see here. 
All right, let's do Sony's question here. Uh, oh, too bad. I'd love to bring you on to the show. Um, paying off your mortgage. Why is 3% guaranteed return better than putting more in a taxable account, which will have more gains over time? Well, you don't know it will have more gains over time. It's a risk question. So if you believe that you will earn more over time in the taxable account, then borrow as much money as you want at 3%. Uh, but the 3% is a guaranteed return. Um, making 6 or 7 or 10% in the stock market is not uh, a guarantee. And so you can't ignore risk there. Um, you know, if you have a need to, to leverage up your life and to borrow money at 3% in order to invest in the stock market, uh, go ahead and do that. I don't have that need anymore. So when I see a 3 or 4 or 5% guaranteed return, that's pretty attractive to me. I'll put a significant amount of money into that um, because I've already got, you know, a large seven-figure amount in the stock market earning money. Uh, if you were starting out with a $50,000 portfolio, you probably have a little more need to take on leverage risk than I do. Okay, we're going to bring you on here, Ian, if I can, just to try this out. Add you, uh, and then you'll notice that you're kind of catch up in the contribution in the conversation once we bring you on. It turns out this isn't totally <laughs> There's actually about 20% percent uh, of what we're doing. <laughs> All right, I got Ian up here. So this okay. is, uh, let's, uh, let's hear your question, Ian. All right. Um, so um, my question is, what age were your children able to perform where they could eventually earn a taxable income and put money into a Roth uh, specifically for WCI other than modeling? Uh, for those of us who don't uh, have a, a blog or a venue where you can do that, like uh, home office tasks or just wondering at what age were they able to start doing more? And or... That's a great question. Obviously, the modeling is, is a sweet gig for a couple of yeah. reasons. Um, I mean, number one, like, you can start them at, yeah, there's a good model right there. Yeah. Uh, you can start them out <laughs> super young, right? That kid's old enough yeah. to be a model. They have baby models out there. And so I Hi, start Ellie. paying them as babies as a model, right? And if you look yep. at the going rate for a model, it's like $100 an hour. And so you can pay them a lot of money yeah. to be a model. Um, and so modeling is a great option I've found uh, for my kids. And that's why I've used that. That's what he's talking about. I literally deduct what? modeling as a business expense it's because the only owners of the business are their parents. They don't have to pay any payroll taxes, they don't make enough money to pay income taxes, but we take all their money and put it in a Roth IRA. I mean, it's a great tax gift. Uh, but what he's asking is how old were they before they could do something else for white coat investor? Well, you look at what else I need for white coat investor you got to be fairly old, right? I've had Whitney writing some articles. I think she started at age 12 or so. Um, you know, I just had a discussion with her yesterday trying to get her to write more of them, but um, she's so busy. <laughs> right now she's working as a lifeguard. Um, so uh, i got to be a little bit older. It's got to be age that is reasonable for the work they're doing. If you have a rental property or something, you can have them go help clean it up and you can uh, pay them for that. That's an option. Um, but for the most part, for most jobs, they're going to be in their teenage years before you can start paying them earned income. And, uh, you know, all the money she makes uh, lifeguarding is going to get put into her Roth IRA as well. Um, but, you know, I think, I think that's the answer in my case was about 12 years old. Um, that's why modeling is such a sweet gig. You can start it so much earlier. Thank you. Cute, cute kid. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. All right, that's fun. So I think we're going to do more of these down the road. We'll uh, put them together, maybe put them on YouTube, maybe incorporate them into the podcast. Thanks, everybody, for participating. Uh, we'll post this in the group, and, and people will be able to see it later. Uh, but thanks for being on. I think my phone battery is about to die, so we better stop this. But thanks for participating in our first Facebook Live.